Mount Ventura Boulevard, on the road from San Francisco to Los Angeles, we find the operator of a roadside service station turning on his radio to tune in, calling all cars. As the tubes are warming up, a police patrol car rolls into the station. Hello, oh, Ed. Hey, fill it up with Rio Grande cracked gasoline. We're going to need all the speed we can get tonight. Well, you've come to the right place. Rio Grande cracked gasoline will give you all the speed you need and more to spare. You're telling me? The city chemist knows. He's analyzed every gasoline on the market, and he specifies Rio Grande cracked gasoline for police cars. And come to think of it, he specifies Rio Grande cracked gasoline for fire engines, ambulances, and motorcycles, too. So I guess it must be the speediest gasoline, or the city wouldn't tell us to use it. Hey, this tetraethyl has something to do with cracked uh, speed, hasn't it, Ed? Yeah, Ed. Uh, what is the dope on tetraethyl? Well, Rio Grande tells me that tetraethyl keeps your motor cooler. You know, when you're getting all that extra speed and power out of Rio Grande, you need some dope to sort of keep your engine from getting too hot and pinging on you. Say, uh, speaking of dope, Ed, do us a favor, will you? Sure. What is it? Now, we're looking for a gang of dope smugglers. If you see any cars coming through here from the north tonight with Chinese in them, make a note of the license numbers, will you? Sure, be glad to. Hey, look, here comes a car now. Let's play detective. Hey, boy, oh, boy, you know, it sure is good to get out and stretch the legs. Yes, I should say it is, yeah. Yeah, it's a long drive from San Francisco to Los Angeles in one day. Well, I'll sell you some good gasoline to get you there faster. You mean Rio Grande Crack? Well, what do you suppose I drove in here for? That's the kind I've been using all the way from San Francisco. And believe me, boy, you're selling good gasoline. I'm getting better mileage than I ever got before. Oh, uh, say, by the way, what time is it? Time? 8.30. Have you got a radio here? I don't want to miss that Calling All Cars program the Rio Grande people put on. Been thinking about it all day while I've been enjoying this police car performance they talk about. Hey, that's right. You know that dope case that Chitwith is on tonight? Hey, what do you say, Bill? We can watch the road from here, then we can all listen. Okay. Well, right this way, gentlemen. Sit down. I'll turn it on loud. Calling all cars. The presentation of the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 51. A narcotic ring is operating out of a Chinese restaurant in Hollywood. Watch out for suspect. That's all. Rose and Chris. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our great pleasure again to introduce Captain Eddie Chipwood, head of the narcotic squad of the Los Angeles Police Department. Captain Chipwood. Uh, good evening. Chief Davis has gone into the files of my detail for the material for tonight's Samus Invasion. The work of the men on the narcotic squad is especially hazardous, for they are called upon constantly to deal with criminals who not only are naturally desperate, but very often are stimulated to an unmanageable degree by drugs. The type of man who stoops the lowest to traffic in human misery and grow rich on the weaknesses of others could not be expected to stop at mere murder. An interesting thing about narcotic cases is the possibility of discovering an international ring through a single arrest at a point of sale. The worldwide operation of dope peddlers makes necessary constant cooperation between municipal, state, and federal officers. Such is the case in tonight's story. Our logical operations began the untangling of a web which stretched across the continent and all the way to Europe. But I'm getting ahead of the story. We'll let the actors tell that. Early last spring, information comes to the narcotic detail of the Los Angeles Police Department that dope is being peddled from a chop suey restaurant in Hollywood to a high-class clientele. Captain Chitwood places a careful stake on the place. And for weeks, officers inside and outside of the restaurant become acquainted with the movement of the habitués of the resort. As the days go by, the officer's interest centers on a well-known actor, son of a world-famous woman. Out of deference to this prominent woman, we will refer to her unfortunate son as Mr. X. 
the officers permit Mr. X to make a purchase of narcotics from Fong, a Chinese connected with the establishment. And then after the young man has left the place, Chitwood and his men follow him to his home. As he is about to enter the house, Chitwood steps out of the shadows in front of him. I beg your pardon, Mr. X. You're under arrest. Under arrest? Uh, what for? Possession of narcotics. But, but there must be some mistake. Risk him, boys. Well, look here. This is an outrage. Do you realize who I am? Well, I'll have you thrown off the force. I'll... Uh... Hey, here it is, Captain. In his upper right-hand vest pocket. Good. Now, you'd better quiet down, Mr. X. You see, we're mighty certain of what we're doing before we make an arrest of this sort. All right, come along. Well, well, what are you going to do to me? Lock you up. But you can't do that. You mustn't do it. It would ruin me. It would kill my mother. Yeah, you should have thought of that before you started playing around with this stuff. Listen, you must realize I'm no Main Street hype. Sure, I've got a habit. But I don't do anyone any harm. I'm no criminal. Yeah, you're a lawbreaker. Yes, but there, there must be some other way. Think of my mother. Mm, there might be another way. What? What is it? Tell me. Can I trust you? Well, of course you can. You know, you're in a tough spot, Mr. X. I know that. I can send you up. I know that, too. But in my business, I'm in interested in more than the confiscation of the result of a single sale. I'm after the mob that's peddling this stuff. Where'd you get this from? From Song at the White Lotus. Yeah, we know that. But who'd he get it from? I don't know. Are you sure you don't? Positive. Will you help us find out? Well, I... I don't know. That is... Well, it's your only way out. Now, you arrange with Fong for another purchase. If you play square with us, I promise you we won't press charges against you. Well, you don't give me much choice. Well, you have an alternative. You can go to jail. No, no, I can't do that. Very well. Be in my office tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, and I'll have the marked money ready for you. Contact Fong tomorrow afternoon and tell him you want another ounce. We'll do the rest. <laughs> Hello, Fong. How are you today? Oh, very well. And how are you? I'm okay. And maybe you eat now? Oh, uh, I don't know. I'm not very hungry. Just a small order of chop suey. Yes, sir. You had pleasant uh, sleep last night? Yes, yes. Fine. Uh, and Fong? Yes, sir? Uh, I'll want some more. Some more sleeping powder? Yes. Well, you have used all you have already? Well, not exactly. Uh, but you see, I'm going north for a couple of weeks. I need a supply. Well, well, I got some more for you. Uh, about the same amount? Yes, uh, same amount. Well, it will take some time. I must arrange things. Yes, yes, I, I understand that. But when will you have it? Oh, maybe so tonight. Good. Bring it to my house tonight. Employing state narcotic officers as well as his own men, Chipwood tails the Chinese from the restaurant to a Hollywood apartment where Fong contacts one Peter Benson. While one pair of officers continues to tail Fong, another follows Benson, who drives out Whittier Boulevard to the home of Max Weber in Belvedere. Here, Benson procures a package. Permitting Benson to return to Fong under the unseen convoy of a group of officers, Chipwood takes Weber into custody. In his place, officers discover a large quantity of narcotics and on Weber's person a portion of the marked money. Weber is escorted to headquarters in Officer Robinson's private car, while other officers are arresting Benson as soon as he turns over the narcotics to Fong, and arresting Fong at the moment that he gives the dope to Mr. X. In his office, Captain Chitwood and a brother officer are discussing their great good luck as they await Officer Robinson's return from Lincoln Heights Jail, where he has gone to book the prisoners. Well, Ed, not a bad night's work. I eh? should say not. We knocked over that mob like duck pin. Yeah, that's the way it goes. You put in weeks getting information and laying the trap, and then it's all over in a single night. You did some neat planting on this job, Chitwood. And we've got marked money on every one of those guys. Well, uh, that's part way due to their own stupidity. You know, they're so overcautious that they're a pushover for a smart cop. Yeah, right. And when you knock them over, you get them all. Well, I'll bet this is one of the biggest outfits in town. Oh, no question about it. And it looks like we got them all. From Weber, the big shot, on down. Oh, here's Robinson at last. Hey, where the devil have you been? Oh, I had a flat tire and had to change it myself. And it was a lucky thing I did. Oh, what do you mean? I'll take a look at these. Uh, what is it? Oh, I can see it's about a thousand pieces of paper. That's right, but get this. I found these stuck down between the cushions and the rear seat when I pulled it up to get my jack. Well, what of it? Well, they were stuffed behind the seat where Weber was sitting. Oh, I see. Hey, how good are you at jigsaw puzzles? Well, I don't know, but I think we got a full night's work ahead of us in piecing these things together. Now, let's get started, then. Robinson is right. All night, the officers bend over a thousand pieces of paper, piecing them together. 
pasting the bits onto a piece of cardboard. There is no pretty color design to lead the players in this jigsaw puzzle, only a few scrawled lines of writing. Gray dawn filters through the smoke-filled room, dissipating the electric light's glaring beams before the three officers, their eyes sunken and bloodshot, straighten up from their task. Uh, well, that's finished. Yeah, let me see now. It looks to me like Salvatore Mancuso, 817 Flatbush Avenue, Brooklyn, you know? Yeah, that's right. Now the question is, who's he? Well, obviously someone connected with Weber's outfit, or Weber wouldn't be in such a hurry to destroy the address. Uh, yes, or maybe Weber's connected with Mancuso's outfit. What do you mean? We may have stumbled onto something bigger than we thought. Oh, uh, Ed, have you looked over that stuff phone sold, Mr. X? Yes, why? Uh, where's it come from? Uh, it looks like French manufacture to me. Mm-hmm, that would tally with this address. Did you figure this Mancuso is the big importer? Right. Say, Ed, will you get the blotter with Weber's signature on it? Okay. What are you going to do now? I'm going to turn this over to the Federals. We'll write a note now to Mancuso in Weber's handwriting, introducing a pal of And the pal will be a Federal man? Right. <laughs> And while Captain Chitwood has been running down the narcotic ring in Los Angeles, a sailor aboard a French liner unsuspectingly begins his role in this stranger-than-fiction story. The steamship Champlain is one day out of New York City. The early spring crossing has been uneventful. The fogs of the Newfoundland banks lie behind. And now the vessel skims through a lake-like calm, and the temperature soars as she crosses the Gulf Stream. Tomorrow morning, Ambrose Lightship will be passed, and tomorrow evening, Guillaume Rosanne, first-class seaman, will once more stand on Broadway, his broad, breton face agape at the light, and his unaccustomed ears dinning with the noise, and his heart beating a little faster with loneliness for his pretty little wife back at Le Havre. But this morning, there is no time for thought to Marie, for there is work to be done, and already the third officer has seen him daydreaming, and is shouting at him. Wait a minute, wait. Oh, let that pig of an officer. One can never please him. Tais-toi, mon vieux. One must walk. It is the same anyway. Ah, peut-être. Très bien. Let us get at this ventilator. All right. I need that can of pan. <laughs> Vous savez, Jules, me, I am tired of this sea. I think I shall quit next trip. Quit? Then what will you do? Oh, get a little farm for Marie and me. Uh, raise legumes, uh, peut-être des enfants. <laughs> <laughs> I have been saying the same thing for 15 years, mon vieux. But I never left the sea. Yeah, bien, I mean to do so. I want to... Me, alors, regarde. Look at this. Qu'est-ce que c'est? A package with me on the ventilator. Now, well, what could that be? Je ne sais pas. It, uh, it smells funny. Better turn it to the third officer. And have him blame me for it? <laughs> Vous savez, if the compass did not work, I believe that so that one would blame me for moving the North Star. <laughs> well, what are you going to do with this? Just this. Rosen, you, you, you should not have done that. You should not have thrown it overboard. Why not? It might have contained something valuable. Maybe diamonds. Diamonds. <laughs> Do people leave diamonds in the ventilators? <laughs> the next afternoon, after the passengers have all left the ship, Guillaume Rosan, dressed in his land clothes, walks down the cruise gangplank. On the pier, he is met by a stranger. Bonjour, monsieur. Et vous Guillaume Rosin? Mais oui, monsieur, pourquoi? Bien, <coughs> un de vos amis du Havre m'a demandé de vous rencontrer ici. Un ami à moi? Euh, Qu'est-ce? Il veut vous surprendre. Venez, nous causerons dans mon automobile. Bien, bien, monsieur. Entrez. All right, Benji. Sit still and don't let me hear a peep out here, I'll plug you. Mais qu'est-ce que c'est? Il dit qu'un ami de moi est dit ici. Ne me tais pas. Je vais à faire... Ah, shut up, Benji. You cannot fall and talk. You stab the United States, so speak it. What is it that you want? What have I done? I told you, I won't shut up. Come on, Dominic. Let's get this guy out of here. All right. The astonished and frightened sailor is whisked through New York streets to a flat in Brooklyn. His hands bound behind his back, he is hurled into a chair and questioned by his swarthy captors. 
You was working on the hurricane deck of the Champlain yesterday, wasn't you? When, sir? Yes, sir. You was painting ventilators, wasn't you? Yes, sir. Did you find anything in one of them ventilators? Uh, no. Hold his hand open, Dominic. Good. Now hand me that cigarette. There. Oh, uh, I can't stand getting the heat, eh, Frenchy? All right, then, come clean. Did you find anything in them ventilators? Me. Me, we. Yes. A package. It was disinfectant, I think. Disinfectant, huh? Yeah, that's right. That's what it was. What'd you do with it? I threw it overboard. You what? Are you dirty? Oh, wait a minute, Blackie. Now, we can't have anything. You bought him up? Maybe he's lying. Well, all right. Was it yours, monsieur, this little package? Yes, it was ours. It was no disinfectant. It was morphine. 40,000 francs worth. Get out me, Frog. Now we want a proof from you. What did you do with if it? If you want to live, you'd better tell what you did with that package. I, but I was... I, oh, monsieur, I was lying before. I sold it. You sold it? How much you get for it? Over $3,000. That'd be about right. Where's the money? I have it not. Sir. Now, listen, Fancy, I'm losing patience with you. How would you like this cigarette in one of your eyes? Oh, no, 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 do not do that. Well, Please, then talk please. and talk fast. Where's the money? I, I, I said it to marry my wife in front. Now, look here. How would you like to spend the rest of your life tied to this chair? No, no, no. Will you, you get that wait. dough back from France? May we? I will try, sir. Ah, you better stop trying right now. Here is a pen and some paper. I'm going to unfasten your hand. You write a letter to your wife telling her to send that money back to you right away. Don't tell her you've been here or anything else, huh? Just tell her to send back the dough. Wait, but... Oh, but... they'll find your corpse riding out past Staten Island some night. Fearing for his life, unfortunate Guillaume Rosanne writes the letter to his wife, demanding her to return the non-existent $3,000. While Rosanne's letter is en route to France, a federal officer bearing Chitwood's forged letter of introduction from the head of the Los Angeles narcotic ring calls at the Flatbush Avenue address, which he discovers is the office of the Two World Importing Company. Yes, sir? What can I do for you? I have a letter to Salvatore Mancuso. Is he in? I'm Salvatore Mancuso. Here's the letter. Oh, you're a friend of Max Weber, huh? Right. Come into the office here where we won't be disturbed. Sit down. Tell me, how is Maxie? Oh, he's fine. Doing lots of business out on the coast. Yeah, Max's a good boy. He tells me in this letter that you want to take over the territory. That's right. My home's up in Scranton. I want to handle your stuff through that district. Yeah, well, you ought to do some good business among those coal miners. That's what I tell you. How soon do you want to get started? Just as soon as I can. How much merchandise are you prepared to sell me? Any amount. Hey, you don't fool, do you? Why do you keep it here? No, this office is just a blind. The stuff's over at the apartment. Well, I'd like to begin easy. Say about five grand, huh? Okay. When can I get it? Right now, if you want. No, I... I got some people I want to see today, but I want to get the 845 for Scranton tonight. Suppose I pick it up just before I get the train, say a little past seven. All right. Where do I get it? 62 Kingsland Avenue. 62 Kingsland Avenue. I'll be there with bells on. Shortly after 7 o'clock, the federal agent appears at the flat on Kingsland Avenue. Oh, good evening. All set to get your train? Just about. You got the stuff? Yeah. You got the money? Right here. Five grand even. Count it. Uh, it looks right to me. Here's your package. Thanks. Now you can stick up your hand. Dominic, it's the rain. Shut up and reach for the ceiling. The boys at the back will take care of Dominic. Now look here. Ah, hold it. Save your breath. We got you with all the evidence we need, and you know it. If it's any encouragement to you, your friend Max Weber was pinched in Los Angeles ten days ago. The federal raiders confiscate $75,000 worth of narcotics in Mancuso's flat. The dope smuggler is released on a $20,000 bail at about the same time as a very puzzled young French woman calls upon the prefet of police in La Havre. Bonjour, madame. What can I do for you? Oh, monsieur le prefet, I have here a letter from my husband. It is very strange. Let me see. Ma chérie Marie, please send back to me 40,000 francs I sent you. Address it to me. Care of the Two Worlds Importing Company, 817 Flatbush Avenue, Brooklyn, New York. Etats Unis, Guillaume. Well, madame, what is it so strange about that? 
Send him the 40,000 francs and be done with it. Oh, but, Monsieur le Préfet, he has not sent me any money. I don't know what he means. He must be in some trouble. <laughs> Does uh, your husband often get into trouble, madame? Oh, no, no. Not Guillaume. He is a good man. But that America, all oh, strange things up on there. Maybe this is one of those, uh, commandito, or uh, kidnapping. When does your husband boat get in? Uh, day after tomorrow. Well, if he does not arrive on his boat, then we can be sure he is in danger. But then what will you do? Then we have an international incident on our hands. I will turn this information over to the Sûreté, and they will at once notify the New York police. <laughs> While Marie anxiously awaits the arrival of the steamship uh, Champlain, her suffering husband is being questioned once more by Mancuso. Now, look here, Frenchy. Why haven't we got that money yet? Uh, there has not been time. It takes time for a buck boat to cross the ocean. I believe you're lying to me, Frenchy. Mais, monsieur, you saw my letter. You mailed it yourself. Yeah, but how do I know your old lady will send us the dough? I have assured you. That ain't enough. I want the truth from you, Frenchy. Pull off his shoes, Dominic. Okay. Ah, uh, hand me those matches. Now, hold his feet up. And yeah, how does this feel, Frenzy? Oh, yeah, oh, not enough for you. Oh, now, Frenzy, I want the truth. What did you do with that package? I sold, sold it. I tell you, I sent the money to my wife. Oh, right. Tell me the truth. Mais mon Dieu, mon Dieu, arrête, arrête! C'est la vérité. Je ne mens pas. Je ne mens pas. And no amount of torture can sway Roseanne from his story, for he is convinced that his captors will surely murder him if they discover the real truth. A few days later, quite by accident, the federal officer who had arrested Mancuso drops into the office of the inspector of the missing persons detail, just as the inspector is having a laugh. <laughs> you know, here's one for you, Harry. Some French sailor jumps ship over here, and he writes his wife for a lot of dough. And the old lady takes her to the preffy of police, and now they're writing us. I suppose they expect us to turn the whole New York police department to hunt for one missing mariner. <laughs> no, probably got tired of the old lady and got himself a new sherry on this I side. I suppose. Huh? Here, read this letter. It's a panic. Hey, Tim, this looks like something to me. Yeah, how come? Well, this guy, Roseanne, asked his wife to send the money to the Two Worlds Importing Company on Flatbush Avenue. Hey, what of that? Plenty. That's the blind that Mancuso used for his narcotic operations. You know, this letter might be a ransom note. Uh, that don't look like any ransom note I ever saw. No, but I got a hunch it is. And if it is, I've got Mr. Mancuso right where I want him. If I can pin kidnapping on him, I'll put that baby away for life. <laughs> During his freedom on bail, Mancuso has been constantly shadowed by federal officers, and each of his several hideouts is known. Robert Primrose, the federal agent, orders his men to make simultaneous raids early the following morning. Primrose himself leads his men to the Kingsland Avenue flat, from which he had taken Mancuso a few days previously. Everyone posted? Yeah. Here we go, then. Who's there? Officer Primrose, I want to talk to you. I'll come around tomorrow. I've gone to bed. You want me to break this door in? Hey, can I guy get his rest? All right, boys, let's break it down. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'll let you in. All right, now what do you want? I don't know yet, but I'm going to find out. Keep your eye on him, Steve. All right. Hey, you big palooka. What's the idea? Oh, I, I, I'm sorry, ma'am. You... You better get some clothes on and get out in the front room. The place is pinched. Oh, there you are. Oui, monsieur. Here I am. But who are you? I'm a federal officer. You're Rosanne, I suppose. A federal officer? Oh, then I'm free. Free. But how did you ever find me? Your wife took your letter to the police and they notified oh, us. Oh, monsieur Marie, ma petite mon ange. I knew she would do it. I knew she now, would do it. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Don't get excited. I've got to cut these ropes for you. Merci bien. Merci. Boy, monsieur, you know what I do. No, what? I am through with the sea. I go back to Le Havre and take my Marie out on a little farm. I never want to see your Etats-Unis again. I am going home. And to New York, some nuts. <laughs> Weber, Benson, and Fong, the Los Angeles members of the International Narcotic Ring, were all sentenced to Leavenworth for terms prescribed by law. And Mancuso and his wife, Dominic, 
and Dominic are at present awaiting federal trial on charges of violating the Lindbergh anti-kidnap law. It is to be hoped that they will receive life sentences under the law, but even if they should receive shorter terms, the narcotic charges against them assure us that they will be out of the way of society for some years to come. Thank you, Captain Chitwood. And now let's go back to that highway service station. Hey, our friend Chitwood certainly started something. I guess we better get back on the job, Jim, and make heroes out of ourselves, too. Okay, Bill. Well, so long, Jim. So long. So long, boys. Look at him pick up speed. Now, those police cars really do use Rio Grande crank gasoline, eh? I thought it was just one of those advertising cars. Uh, no, sir. Why, wherever Rio Grande cracked gasoline is sold, more police cars use it than any other brand. I wonder why. Well, you found out today, didn't you? That cracking process makes Rio Grande gasoline work wonders in your motor. You get more speed and you get more power and, well, you yourself said that you get more mileage. For example, you remember how that dope peddler on the program we just heard tore a piece of paper into a thousand bits? Yes. Well, that's what Rio Grande's cracking process does. It tears the crude oil apart and tears every drop to pieces. It releases millions of elements of energy that go to waste in uncracked gasoline. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm sold. I've been using Rio Grande cracked gasoline ever since that radio program calling all cars sold it to me. But I, I do need some oil. Well, I've got a canned oil here made by the same people who control the Rio Grande Oil Company. Wait a minute. Here it is. Sinclair Opaline Motor Oil. You see the dinosaur on the can? You've seen Sinclair's advertising about the dinosaurs who lived 80 million years ago when this oil was first beginning to mellow. Well, any oil that's 80 million years old costs too much. Give me a 25-cent oil. Now, this is it. Sinclair Opaline. Only 25 cents a can for a quart can. Now, you can't beat that. No fooling. Well, then give me a can of Sinclair oil. That's a good buy. Guess I'll get all my oil as well as my gas at Rio Grande Station from now on. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Cancellation broadcast 51 regarding a narcotic ring in Hollywood. Suspects in this case are now all in custody. That's all. Rose and quote. Calling All Cars is written and produced by William N. Robeson. This is Frederick.